everyone. All right, we'll give it another minute here. All right, let's get started. Uh, good to see a bunch of people here, as always. Uh, Randy, Nick, Gary, Eric, always good to see you. Um, I believe we are ready to uh, try another uh, open hour. I'm actually thinking about this. I don't know that I have ever hosted an open hour. Like I've been in them before, but I usually, I, I usually don't drive. But Janae's on a plane, and so she can't drive. <laughs> Good to have you do it, Tom. First thing we're going to mention, as always, uh, you can follow Salt Project on many platforms as we are constantly broadcasting all sorts of stuff. Uh, the Salt Air series is on YouTube. Um, also, uh, make sure that you check out the hacks. I'm a big fan of the hacks since it basically mandates that people listen to me yammer on about something for a half hour to 45 minutes. We try and make things as funny as possible and entertaining. Okay. We're going to be going over a bunch of the usual suspects in here. Um, some general updates, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on with SaltConf. Um, take a look at some SEPs, uh, and uh, tell you guys where, where we're currently at from a release perspective. So we have two virtual meetups that are coming in August. Uh, these meetups, one of them, uh, actually, uh, they're, they're both me, now that I'm looking at this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, and they're both on the 18th. It'll be a lovely and long day for me. Uh, but 5 p.m. Mountain Time, I'm gonna be giving a presentation on pop. Uh, yeah, that's like, uh, that, that's six days away. So it's okay that I haven't started working on this yet. It'll be good, it'll be good. And uh, on the 19th at 11 a.m. Uh, SGT, which is some Asian time zone, which will be 9 p.m. for me, uh, I'm going to be giving a presentation on uh, the ins and outs of remote execution uh, for the Asia Pacific. And so if anybody wants uh, to hear an overview of POP, I haven't done very many of these overviews of POP. Um, and this is, uh, this is one of these concepts that we have that grew out of SALT, for those of you who are less familiar with POP, uh, and is being actively used in a lot of projects moving forward. Um, a lot of my thinking around POP is uh, that uh, we need to rethink how we make software and make software very generically pluggable. And that when software is generically pluggable, then uh, it makes it a much more, much more future resistant how that software is used and utilized. That means the software that we write once can be reused in multiple places in an even more flexible way 
and a lot of current programming models. And so I'm going to have some fun talking about that um, in six days. And then a lot of the presentations that we're giving to the APJ region, uh, we're just really kicking off a lot of our community engagement out there um, in Asia Pacific. And so a lot of the presentations we're giving are about the basics. This is really only the second meetup that we're doing in APJ. And so the first one was on general config management. And so this one's going to be on uh, remote execution and some of the constructs that are inside there. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, invade that late, uh, late lunchtime in six days or no late in the evening if you're yeah that's what i'm saying late in the evening if you're uh here in the states if anyone of course is here today from abj please make sure that you uh, make it there uh one quick thing to mention is that uh, many of you have probably noticed by now that we've rebranded which means that all of the old brand stuff is on sale as we're trying to liquidate it so if you want like a really cheap polo, now's the time. And uh, I should mention, uh, you get some interesting attention while wearing salt stack swag. Since it makes up about 40% of my wardrobe, uh, oftentimes I'm out and about and somebody will stop. And so just last night, I met a kid, I met with my daughter's uh, start a school open house and I'm wearing a salt stack shirt and somebody says, hey, you in DevOps? And I look back and uh, smiled and said, I am DevOps, and walked away. So get some salt stack swag. We're trying to get a little more consistency inside the salt stack blog as well. Um, huge fans of people sending us blog posts. Um, don't need to be long. Really what we want to see from a blog post is somebody who's just able to say either this is a brief how-to on a feature inside of SALT or this is how I'm using SALT today. And that, they, again, they don't need to be long. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to address something that I think is, at this point, I think is kind of comical. We had this big to-do about what format these would come in whether they'd be like a restructured text or Word docs. The people who post them on the website post them based on what they look like in a Word doc. So give them to us in a Word doc. And if uh, you don't like using Word, then uh, write them in whatever the devil you want and save them as a Word doc and send them to us or convert them online. Like this is not hard to do. Um, and I know it's not hard to do because I passed my Microsoft Office class in college using uh, nothing but OpenOffice. Pandoc can convert to Word pretty easily. Yeah, ton of everything converts to Word now. All, all those things are in place, especially since OpenOffice switched to LibreOffice. And all the LibreOffice guys were like, hey, we're going to build really good support for this. And make it make all the specs easier to read, so it's easier for people to figure out how to how to transform into DocX. And since Microsoft said, "Hey, we're going to be open source now," um, they've figured out open source in a lot of ways. It's it's very impressive. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about briefly. Actually, let me stop. Any questions, comments, arguments, or rebuttals so far? I'm open to rebuttals. No, can't say I didn't try. Okay, SaltConf 21 is coming up. We uh, The call for speakers is still open, but not for long. And uh, we want your presentations. Uh, for those of you on the call who are internal to SaltStack, uh, we are going to be just jerks about making you guys present on things as usual. Um, which is my way of saying, if you work for SaltStack, you don't necessarily need to get your presentation in right away. Although if you get a presentation propos proposal in earlier, it's, it does make everyone's lives a lot easier. Now, for everybody outside, uh, please get your proposals in 
um, so that so that we can make sure that these things are nice and lined up. Uh, we definitely want to be able to know uh, what our options are for SaltConf talks. We have already received quite a few fantastic proposals, uh, but uh, but we could certainly need we could certainly use some more. Okay, now, if, uh, that was the other thing I wanna say. If you're worried about um, what, to, what to submit, or if you're torn and you're thinking, oh, I do wanna present at SaltConf, but uh, I don't, you know, I, I feel like the terrain has changed, or is this conference gonna be different with VMware being around and all this stuff, uh, feel free to reach out. Reach out on Slack and ask, um, uh, you can send me an email. I might not get back to it right away. I get a lot of emails, uh, but uh, we're more than happy to give you feedback. But but again, use cases are always great. Tutorials on how to do things are always great. Um, how you've solved specific problems using Salt. These are things that we that we love to hear. And so please don't feel intimidated. Uh, the fact that uh, we're inside VMware that doesn't change what SaltConf is going to be all about. It's still SaltConf. It's just virtual because we got this here pandemic now. Okay. That goes through the majority of kind of the announcement section. And so I'm going to... Actually, uh, for announce, uh, we did just have a release yesterday. Oh, for Salt 3003.2. Derek, you mind uh, giving us giving us a brief overview of that release? I could actually put some links in the chat uh, to the release notes. I think there might we might have a let me double check if we got a blog post up to even. Wasn't up when I checked earlier. Well, I should have, I'll at least have the 3000.2 um, release notes and the change log. So I'll just link to those. Um, but yeah, we got that all. Here we go in the Zoom chat. Here's the release notes and um, which is a list of some of those bug fixes. And uh, da, 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 da change log. We also have the main change log if we're looking at the freeze branch. Right here. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, any of the devs want to talk about particular changes that went into it, but um, uh, Wayne, you were starting to mention something, but I don't know if you were going to be talking about it. But we also have the native minions even had some new releases. So if Murphy wants to talk about those related to that was for 3003.1 releases for native minions. Too. Yeah, I can uh, talk to those. Essentially, now we the Arista 32 bit and 64 bit and the Juniper writers, the native minions have been updated to 3003.1. Takes us a little time ran into some issues with rest of 32 bit. So we just got in under the wire with that. Um, the 32 bit Arista were kind of limited to file size that the, the Arista um, command line can handle, which is just under 65 meg. So we had to pull some functionality out. Uh, things like remote uh, PDB, for example. Uh, it's, that isn't in there. We had to get rid of M2 crypto, but we still have Pi Crypto Domex in there on the 32-bit side. But they're both all operational and working. And the Arista support now includes support for fast CLI on the command line in the Arista router. Uh, there was a couple of issues with the GCC Live C version. And depending on the version of Arista routers, they went from version 2.16 to 2.18, then went retrograde to 2.17. So it, it took a little bit of effort to pick a version of libc and GCC that would work 
across the whole range on the 32-bit Arista platform. Um, on the Juniper side, it's just basically a ramp up with 3003.1 uh, of salt. Um, there's no major differences there, just support for the latest version of salt, of late, late, what was the latest version of salt, which is now 3002.2, which will be uh, something I'll start into next week. I'm looking at getting things updated for that. Uh, in other news, for that, we put into QA um, support for Solaris 10, a Python 3 based native meme, which will be, is going through QA as we speak. And we hope to have support for Solaris 11.4 with um, a native minion here shortly as well. We have an Intel version and a Spark one coming. Uh, the Intel one's about to go through QA as well. So can't say when that's going to be released because you never know what testing we'll find. Hopefully nothing. And that's me for native minions. That's fantastic. Uh, anybody else want to comment on anything in the in uh, this release? Actually, there is one other thing I can comment about native means, and that is they have been moved into out of the enterprise repositories into salt open repositories in GitLab, but they're still private because we've got to go through now and make sure with an audit that there isn't anything in there that shouldn't be in there and um, that we didn't have to worry about with private. So it's basically going through and making sure all the licenses are correct, et cetera, which can take a little while. And that was delayed because we wanted to get the release out. Well, thank you for bringing that up, David. And uh, I mean, we've mentioned this in the past, uh, but I'm excited. One of the things that's been great inside of VMware is that uh, we've been able to open source some things that uh, used to be enterprise um, uh, and things like Delta proxy, as well as uh, the native minion support for um, AAX and uh, Solaris. And so that's uh, that's really exciting, uh, David, that we've got some of those uh, out in the wild now. So that's good stuff. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, unless I've got uh, unless I've got an argument to keep going, uh, I'll dive into salt enhancement proposals. Uh, maybe one more note. <laughs> I'll just keep butting in, Tom. Go um, ahead. Uh, also, at the end of this month, um, salt version three thousand. Uh, that version reaches end of life. It's the final Python two version that we have supported. Um, and so if you're still running on Python 2 or Salt 3000, uh, you should really use this month or use some time to focus on upgrading your, uh, your systems and software um, as, as uh, Python 2 has been into life for over a year now. And uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Derek, uh, thank you very much for that. And this is uh, this is something that is, is pretty important. But I do believe there are still quite a few installations out there that are even older. Uh, we would we would very 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 strongly encourage people to upgrade uh, to get on Python three. Um, uh, we've been able to make a lot of really exciting uh, changes in Salt because of Python three, and moving away from Python two has made all of our lives significantly easier. Um, that transition was a difficult transition for like, the world, <laughs> moving from Python 2 to Python 3. Um, and that also uh, means I'm going to highlight uh, a, a couple of these SAPs. Um, so particularly packaging salt with TMI. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with TMI, uh, I think a lot of people on this call at this point are. Uh, but this is a really nice way that allows us to bundle up and make single binaries and much more portable versions of Python packages. And Tiamat, uh, we put a huge amount of work into Tiamat. There are salt builds in Tiamat that are currently deployed and uh, being used worldwide. Uh, so this is not something that we feel at this point is kind of a, a new and reckless situation. 
uh, because we are, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely in this situation where we feel that Tiamat has been, has been pretty aggressively vetted. Uh, we've got regular builds of Tiamat that are available on repo.sellstack.com, um, as well as uh, some released versions of Tiamat that people, released versions of Sol built with Tiamat that people have been playing around with. Uh, uh, just there, to just to add, Tom, we're we're using Tiamat for the native minions, and we're using it for Salt Stack Enterprise uh, slash config as well. Yeah, and and the, with the native minions, they've been at, being hammered by both Arista, um, Juniper, and been out in the field for over a year without any major issues. So, in a nutshell, we're quite proud of Tiamat. <laughs> Uh, we definitely feel that it has been uh, very well very well vetted at this point. Now, the, the Tiamat saw packaging set um, is proposing a number of things, um, and I'd strongly encourage people to take a look. It's something I'm very excited about uh, since, uh, since I put Tiamat together a few years ago, um, and uh, very excited also because it's going to mean that Upgrading and maintaining installations at Salt moving forward can become significantly simplified. Uh, and the other thing I'll say is that I think that it makes packaging Python software in general a lot easier. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, we can get a little more community interest around it. Uh, as always, shout out to Randy for the help that he's done there. But uh, I do think that Tiamat is something that can be used to make Python packaging in general a lot easier. And then when I say packaging, more so distribution of Python code a lot easier. Um, okay, so with that said, I'm going to ask if uh, anyone has any steps on here that they would like to discuss inside of uh, inside of the open hour right now. Um, on the Tiamat front, we're actually gearing up, um, Tyler and I, for the 8.0 release, um, basically adding the ability to have pluggable build backends in Tiamat. I have PyOxidizer working and actually deployed out um, PyOxidizer built uh, salt binaries today to our environment. Um, so we'll be getting the PyOxidizer backend plugin for Tiamat as well, um, pushed up here shortly. Um, but basically our plan is to add a couple of different backends, which, um, as you know, each one of those has its own pros and cons, uh, depending on what you have in your environment and how you need the binary built. So that should be pretty exciting. And, um, hopefully we get that out sometime soon. Randy, I'm doing backflips over that. That is exciting. Um, I heard that, uh, did, uh, I think the Tyler mentioned, I don't think he's in here. No. Uh, I think the Tyler mentioned to me that he had a Nuitka back end working. Um, Nuitka, he uh, might have gotten it working by now. Um, I haven't spoken to him about that probably in the last week or so. I do know that when we held our first team at working group, uh, which now we have one, um, uh, basically he ran into issues with it and had to drop it. But we have, uh, I think, Pi EXE working. Um, Pi oxidizer, obviously Pi installer, and we're going to look to expand that further. Okay, no, and then all in all, that is extremely exciting. Um, I was mostly curious if anybody had, I, I probably need to sit down with Tyler and ask him if he got Nuitka working. Nuitka is a beast. <laughs> I love it, but it's a beast. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, transpiling Python in that way. It's 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 a it's a creative. Yep. And then there's um there's another project I have my eye for backends where it actually compiles down to native C. Um and uh, we'll see how that goes. That's exciting. That's extremely exciting. Okay. Does so anybody else want to talk about any of these uh, any of these steps? I have a general question about SEPs. Okay, uh, hit me. How, how big of a change does it have to be before it warrants a SEP versus like just somebody putting in a feature request or, uh, you know, just making a change and putting in a PR for it and trying to guide it through that side? So um, that really depends on how that feature is structured. If we're looking at a feature that's going into core salt, um, so something that's expanding the state system, 
um, or expanding the reactors or things of that nature, um, then it should probably go through a set. Primarily because we want to make sure that these core features are very well vetted and reviewed, um, and that we've got uh, we've got the opportunity to get really to get feedback on them at this point. A lot of what we've got inside of Salt is uh, very widely used, right? Um, and so we we want to be careful there. If it's in the modular plugin layers, then we generally don't need to worry about it as much. Uh, but if it's something where we want to change existing functionality um, or introduce a new functionality that is intended to supersede old functionality, then that should have a set. Um, uh, which reminds me of, uh, yeah, the change to like the mod state and how I, I never should let that happen. Should, should I not have said that out loud? Um, but yeah, every now and then we get something in there that in retrospect, I look back and go, oh my gosh, that was it. Never should have listened to that person. Should have just said no. Um, no, no is temporary. Yes is forever. <laughs> this is this is true. Yeah, I think um, one of the, the the approaches that I take or uh, principles I think about is that you know the the set allows us to um, not waste time going down kind of a rabbit hole. Uh, of things in like the wrong direction, right? So if we if we write a set, you know, you might take an hour or two to write like a good solid set describing what it is that you want to do, as opposed to spending a week or more building out some feature functionality. Um, and if you you know if you spend all that time and then you open a PR and you've got a ten thousand line pull request, uh, that's <laughs> that's complicated and hard to review uh, to give it a quality review. But if we build on uh, on a SEP and we just say, okay, here's kind of high level what I'm thinking about, uh, what am I missing, what haven't I thought about, um, then more eyes help us to to kind of figure out, okay, let's let's make some changes here. Oh, we should we should think about this before we go ahead and start building this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so the the SEP process allows us to to build up gradually. Uh, larger features and larger changes. Uh, so that way, it, one, <laughs> we can catch kind of bugs earlier, but also two, uh, we're not just springing a huge pull request uh, on the community and saying, hey, look, I made this massive change. Uh, good luck. <laughs> right. Cool. So despite it being core functionality, if I said I wanted to add maybe like a new con minion configuration parameter to gate, like a really easy, you know, set of logic is like 10, 20 lines of code or something like that, that wouldn't necessarily need a SEP. But if it starts to be complex, fundamental changes in how things operate and so forth, that would sort of be a SEP. Yeah, I don't think that a config gating would mandate a SEP. And, and I think part of it too would, is the question of, uh, um, so yeah, if it's changing something or if it's, or if it's adding a major feature, yeah, we should probably do a, shit, do a, do a SEP. Um, but outside of that, you should ask, is it, gonna, is it gonna take me two or three times longer to write the code than it will to write the SEP? If so, I should probably write a SEP first. If it's going to take less time to write the code, well, I'll write the code and make an ask. <laughs> yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, putting in a pull request as a proof of concept for uh, a SEP. <laughs> right, and there's nothing wrong with putting in a pull request and then part of the review process saying, I think this might mandate a SEP. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, does anybody else have any uh, questions, comments, any, any steps they want to talk about in, uh, in more depth? Excellent, I will move forward. All right, we've got a couple of releases currently slated. Um, as always, these are, our, uh, these are our release goal dates. Um, sometimes we get a little bit of release date slippage, uh, but we're but we're closing in on uh, three three thousand. 
We just released 3003.2, right? We, we just announced that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hoorah. Okay. Uh, but 3004 is closing in. Um, as always, uh, we're really excited. Uh, really excited for silicone. Um, hey, I should ask, does anybody on the team have any comments about the silicon release that you're really excited about that you want to highlight real quick? On Windows, we are um, changing the installer to allow people to install anywhere instead of being limited to sea salt on the root directory. That was driven by community, a big part of the Windows working group has been working on that. That's fantastic. You already mentioned it, but I'll just highlight it again. Silicon will, uh, the Silicon release will finally have the, uh, the Delta proxy uh, code moved out of enterprise into open. So that'll be good. And I'm also really excited to hear Shane say sea salt again many times. And it says sea salt by the seashore. Yeah, nothing like uh, nothing like uh, not, yeah, sea, blah, 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 sea salt. I can't even say it once. Uh, yeah, being able to finally open source some of these things is something that's exciting and something that, uh, if I'm transparent, I've had a lot of debates with people for a long time uh, to try and uh, open source a few of these components. Um, and so I am very, very excited uh, to see to see Delta Proxy hit open, uh, open source salt. Um, and I'm very excited to uh, hopefully get some more documentation and some more of uh, how use cases work out there. I'm also excited because I feel that uh, the combination of um, Delta Proxy and Tiamat should make salt easier for more network use cases. And this is something that I've been uh, I've been wanting to push more and more, is that we need to be able to present to new users the diverse use cases that Salt is able to deliver on, so that people can go to saltproject.io and, and instantly see and know how to solve more of these high level use cases. Uh, this is something that I think is really important as we move forward in uh, continuing to get more people using Salt. Uh, there are a lot of use cases for salt out there that people, I think, are just not aware of, that we haven't uh, published the way that we could and should, and that in doing so, we should be able to get a lot more, get a lot more traction, get a lot more excitement around uh, the project. Okay, that wraps up the uh, the agenda uh, that uh, that was prepared for open hour, and so this is where we open up into. Uh, the general nut slinging free for all. And so I'll say, does anybody have any questions, comments, arguments, or rebuttals? Yeah, I wanted to ask about SaltConf and find out if there was going to be a section that uh, walked people through the uh, latest uh, development in Tiamat and how to, uh, like, basically give a walkthrough slash tutorial on how to use it. Uh, I think that, that would be a fantastic thing to have instead of SaltConf. Um, and uh, I, I certainly hope that we will have a presentation on that. Uh, and to be honest, I think that we should have multiple presentations on Tiamat. And so I'm not, I'm not making a hard promise uh, off the cuff, uh, but we should have some presentations on Tiamat. Um, I am planning on doing a, a history of Tiamat presentation and an overview of what it's used for. Um, and it would be great. Uh, uh, Randy, have you submitted a presentation on Tiamat? I'm trying to remember what, because you've yeah. submitted, right? Yeah, I've well, I haven't submitted for this year yet. I'm going to, and it will be Tiamat related, um, particularly on the features around the pluggable backend. Um, but I could run down a list of features, period, uh, pretty easily in that presentation as well. I gave a talk last year about Tiamat and build, the build process behind it. Um, and I've done a virtual conference about it as well. 
So yeah, in a nutshell, uh, we, we should also do an introduction to how to use TMOD and just kind of a walkthrough of, hey, here's the basic features of TMOD. Here's how easy it is to take a random Python project and TMOTerize it. Um, so uh, that's definitely something that we should strongly consider for SaltConf. Uh, will you let me do two talks? <laughs> Uh, go ahead and submit two talks, and uh, we might. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? To be perfectly honest, uh, what we're lacking a lot with TMOD is that, frankly, it needs its own web page. Uh, we should be presenting it to the larger Python community in a bigger way. Um, there's there's a lot that we should be doing with TMOD that, uh, that we're just not. Um, and that's also something that as we're looking forward, I'm hoping that we can get some more some more focused resources on. Um, and there's a couple of things from a TMO perspective also uh, that we're in the process as a team to try and button up right now. Um, we really want to get uh, over some of the last hurdles of packaging salt in TMO. And so with all that, uh, we also should be buttoning up some of the documentation. Um, and we should, again, get, I mean, TMO should have a fancy logo and a web page and an independent presence. Um, that that would all be great if we can figure out how to pull that off. Um, TMAT does have a page, but it's very very sparse. Uh, documentation okay. was a really big um, was a topic in the the TMAT Salt Package Working Group. Uh, there should be one coming up this month here in a week or two, um, and definitely something that we can dive deeper into. Yeah, we definitely need to figure out how to make all of it much, much more robust. Yeah, I'll make a note of that. I, I'm the captain for that group, so I'll make sure that that's brought up and we drive something forward on that. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, comments, arguments, or rebuttals? I was just going to say. There's some questions there. in the chat. Well, there are. Well, I'm blind. <laughs> Yeah. So Mark is asking uh, just a general question. When might we see some news on splitting modules away from what's considered core salt? Uh, that's something I'm really excited to also hear news on, to be honest. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a direct update. Does anybody in the room have an update on where we are with, uh, with salt extensions? So we've started talking about them. Uh, we as the core team haven't had time to start breaking stuff out. Uh, but Pedro, I don't know if Pedro was on the call. Pedro has written some utility programs to make it easier to start uh, either creating new extensions or uh, breaking out uh, extensions. Um, and I know Wayne and I, I think Wayne is still involved, but we were uh, part of an effort to kind of break some of the VMware specific modules out um, using those tools. Um, and it's once we're, we're kind of viewing that as a um, like a test bed of, of moving this forward. Um, but once we once those are kind of baked and, and working and like kind of work, worked all the kinks out, um, we'll, we'll be able to make, make it a lot easier to start breaking stuff out um, and like test those modules. Um, Wayne, did you have anything or Pedro, if you're on the call, did you have anything to say yeah, about I, that? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, so we are working on that. Um, module it is we haven't quite opened it yet um, that'll probably happen in the next couple of weeks um, but yeah so we've been using that as kind of like you said that test bed to to, to practice <laughs> and uh, drink our own champagne or uh, dr drink our own dog food I don't <laughs> um, no it's actually been going really well it's been a, a really good experience so far um, I actually put in a, a pull request um, the other day that was merged into that uh, salt extension is the, the name of the repository. I don't know if we have pushed up a new release to PyPI on that, but um, just kind of helping to improve the, those documentation or that documentation. Um, I know we have a community member um, that has been active in Slack. I've been chatting back and forth with uh, helping them get um, They've been working on some MySQL um, extension module that they've been working on. Um, so it's been good to, to kind of get to see their experience with it. Um, and uh, that's got a lot of good feedback um, as far as that, that extension module process goes. Um, it seems to be going rather well for them. Um, 
there was just, of course, some, uh, uh, I think, as always, <laughs> issues with documentation, um, you know, where we can improve that and make that better um, for people coming into to the project. Um, but um, yeah, it's actually, um, at least the what we've been using the uh, and testing on the extension module for the, the VMware stuff has been working uh, quite well. Um, so we're, we're excited to start uh, or to get that actually um, published here soon. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I highly recommend uh, experimenting with the, the extension module um, process and project. There's a lot of really uh, great benefits to that. Uh, one of them being that the, the test suite can just kind of start out <laughs> nice and small. Uh, and you can build up whatever you, um, uh, processes you need for your extension module. Um, so that's uh, that's super handy. Plus, uh, the release cycle for an extension module can be uh, not tied to salt, which is, I think, one of the biggest uh, advantages. Um, so bug fixes, feature enhancements, uh, things like that can go in uh, much more rapidly than the salt cadence. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anybody else has any other specific questions, but um, that's kind of been my experience with the salt extensions. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. That's an excellent response. Uh, now, uh, we've got a couple of the questions in here. Uh, Randy uh, did answer the question about uh, <coughs> Um, in the chat about uh, is it possible to package in binaries with TMOD? Uh, yeah, TMOD allows you to package in any arbitrary external file. Um, and the TMOD build process also allows you to compile or build any arbitrary third party project as part of the build, build process. And so you can, so say you want to go binary and you want to compile that go binary when you build the, the TMI build, uh, that's what uh, the build section in the tmi.conf file is for. Um, so yeah, you're definitely able to, uh, able to do that. Um, let's see, the, uh, the other end of it that, um, uh, that Randy mentioned is that there is the uh, system copy in option, which allows you to copy in any arbitrary file from your system into the build. Um, now, this would mean that you could externally build um, a component that you want to add into a TMI build. And so what, uh, what you end up with there is the ability to, again, either internally or externally relative to the build process, um, uh, bundle in those components. So again, the uh, the goal there being that any arbitrary third party file, whether it is a Go binary, a Rust binary, a C binary, a Nim binary, um, can be tossed in. I have to uh, I have to throw in uh, throw in some some pro Nim talk. Cause I'm a cause I'm a, cause I'm a punk. That's been my latest or Julia. Hobby. Yeah, or Julia. <laughs> I, my my latest hobby has been learning Nim. I'm very impressed. I like me the Good language. Yeah, it is, a, it is a great language. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, we've already got an answer in the chat to, uh, can we run salt masters in Docker containers? Yes, there are Docker containers out there that run salt masters. Yeah, um, so specifically, I was, I was, so I was actually trying this with having multiple Docker containers and I'm using uh, IPVS to kind of, uh, so IPVS uh, kind of takes the minion connection and then routes it to the to the Docker containers, and then uh, the Docker containers that have the minions connected have a Cindy connected to it. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm I don't know if the, I'm, the setup see the setup itself was relatively easy. Uh, I'm just wondering if I'm maybe forgetting something or I'm not thinking about something. I'm I'm, I'm really only doing this in like a, a scaled down scope with a few minions. <sighs> Because I remember, I think as was IBM, they talked about uh, in the last salt conf, they had a talk where they um, had their minions, 75,000 minions or whatnot on running on multiple salt masters running in Docker containers. But I think they are using uh, salt enterprise as far as I remember. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, is anybody is anybody on this call more familiar with a, a good way to answer that question? Uh, which question, whether or not IBM is using enterprise or the Docker question? No, so uh, the question is mainly uh, if you if you um, if you would do this with either one Docker container that basically just acts as a salt master, and then you have kind of the kind of the, do the documentation or if people do it with multiple containers and then I think so, like someone said sync the keys between the masters and stuff like that so uh, because I think if you just use that multiple darken containers yeah um so so I'm using IPVS to uh, uh, have basically one entry point for the minions and IPVS is uh, taking the minion connections and kind of um, Round robin connecting them to the Docker containers. I asked the same question in Slack. I can uh, I put up a drawing to maybe make it more clear what I did there. The question, my question is mainly if this is kind of a if this is a good uh, uh, kind of something to go forward with, or uh, because I don't know, it it seemed, uh, or if I'm if I'm forgetting something that may, um, something that I may not know if there's anything, yeah. So just, just a few observations from, uh, from my perspective. I don't know that we have a whole lot of documentation out there as far as running, um, running salt within a container. Um, mm -hmm. There are, uh, there are challenges that, that you need to be aware of when you're doing that. Uh, one of the facts, or one of the points being that uh, containers are supposed to be ephemeral. So <laughs> they should be able to go away and uh, c come back uh, relatively uh, with- Yeah, with, that's, yeah, that's- Just being able that. to, to bop them on the head. <laughs> so, yeah. um, uh, and then another thing that um, I think is a point of contention in <laughs> the community in general, is uh, whether or not you run more than one service in your Docker container. Um, many people suggest you should just have the one process per container, um, mm -hmm. which would, uh, from a, a salt perspective, you wouldn't have the uh, minions running in, in a container unless you were doing something like Docker and Docker so that your minion in the Docker container could control uh, other uh, Docker containers. Um, Mm -hmm. it's really it's really kind of up to you as far as what your uh what your comfort level is there um yeah. and, and what your needs are uh i have run uh you know at least in in testing um and i do this a lot just to try and reproduce um issues just running uh masters and minions and containers um typically what i will do is actually use them as the the root process for the container uh, and just spin up the, the uh, master dominion in the foreground and then you can attach and uh, or execute commands in the, the containers and that, te that tends to work uh, relatively well. Um, as mm -hmm. I think it was Vic mentioned there in chat, um, you do need to make sure that you're you know, storing your PKI directories and uh, syncing your keys between masters. But even if, even if you're not doing that, um, you will want to look at like preceding your minions um, with known keys, especially if you're going to uh, make sure they're ephemeral uh, or uh, just have your minions more long lived and then have your uh, like your PKI directory be a volume outside of your Docker container. That's what I'm doing right now. PKI volume is a, is a, is a, a volume outside of the Docker. Nice, nice. Um, are, you trying, then, are you trying to run just the master or, or minions? Because you're just the master, you're, just yeah. the masters. Yeah. So if you're just so, running the master, that's a I lot. think yeah. I, I, <laughs> no, just so, the masters. Yeah. So like, and, you're, I I don't think there's anything like the one thing you have to make sure is that you're that is that uh, I mean, if you shouldn't even need to. Um, I guess it depends on I guess if you want minions that are external to the machine, you do have to make sure you're you're publishing the ports, right? So, yeah, and Docker one hundred and one. Um, yeah, I, I haven't. I, I mean, I've I've used Docker. I mean, within an automated testing environment, I I have this uh, disgusting Rube Goldberg setup where where I have 
um, a um, kitchen salt do uh, docker container that, that sets itself, uh, bootstraps a master onto it. Mm -hmm. that, 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 um, um, that then, uh, you know, publishes its, its port out that it's going to listen to. It kind of discovers what ports are available so that it can pick the right ports. And then, you know, then it uses Salt Cloud to, uh, to set up a, um, and manage some VMs. And yeah. points it points it at the correct port. So, um, so then, uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, all that works for us. Um, yeah. We haven't. We, we there. It's just the 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 only the only considerations we ever had to deal with is making sure that we that we're that we're publishing the correct ports. Yeah. So my containers don't publish ports. Uh, that is handled by uh, by IPVS IP virtual server. So uh, the connections come in. Um, I have uh, IP tables set up to add a firewall mark, mm -hmm. and then um, IPVS takes that firewall mark and makes sure that the same minion, that the both both ports from one minion connect to yeah. the same Docker container. And it, as long as the ports are routed correctly, the minion doesn't care, right? So yeah. We, like it, that, and that's that, the, it seems to so my question is it seems to work and it was relative really relatively easy to set up um so that's the uh, kind of the kind of it seemed kind of too easy that's uh, so there's kind of my suspicion if there if i'm missing something no it, it should it should work just fine um it, it's worked for worked for us for automated testing of of uh of VM management by Salt Cloud, and um, you know, the, like we we don't we don't use your setup. We, we're actually just because it's it's automated testing, so it just has to set it up. It just has yeah. to set up and, and like and like you know, if the tests fail, it leaves you know, uh, test kitchen will leave the VM up. So we so you know we have a little bit of trick, a little bit of magic in the in the beginning of the CI pipeline to check what ports are open. Um, and so if 4505 and 4506 are used, it'll jump ahead to, and then it'll use those, and then those get passed down through in the in the cloud profile, you know, for the automated testing, so that we connect back to the right ports. But as long as you are connecting to the right ports, and the right ports are 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 um, you know are accepting, you don't need to like if if if, uh, if something is routing to your Docker container, the IP. Or the the FW mark is like you're routing everything to your to the the container on the same machine, right? Or mm -hmm. or knows how to do that? Then there really shouldn't be any anything yep. else yet. I, um, the the considerations already that, that you've already taken into account with. I, I would probably make the entire um, Etsy salt directory in and not just PKI a volume. Yeah. Um. I, I they're really it's really not not that um. Not that involved if, uh, um, if you're if you're just doing a simple master with without any. Um, yeah, if you want to run other services on that master, you you would want to investigate using um, running uh, system D or um, as as your PID one, right? As the as the the the, the PID of the of the container. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if is that are you already doing that? No, no, I'm just running. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm using I'm using the. The Docker containers that are up with their uh, in it, whatever they have. Yeah. Honestly, I think like like best practices say you should run, you know, you you should just be running the master, mm -hmm. right? As your as your as your command. But like if you want to do something more complex, there are certain um, there there are certain you have you have to uh, bind mount things like like uh, C groups and. Um, if you're on, if you're using newer kernels that switch to like the new version of C groups, you have to like, you have to like, you know, use a kernel variable to to tell your to to go back to go back to the V1 C groups, you know. The, the, so there's there's those you know to to avoid I guess to avoid having to to use a privileged container, you, you have to you have to bind mount C groups, you have to you have to bind mount, uh, I think, slash run or something like that. I, I I have it I have it all in my in my CI. If you want more details, just um, contact. Uh, I, I'll, I'll contact you on on uh, community Slack. And we can talk more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I think that we're about out of time. 
Um, uh, great to see everybody as always, and uh, see you guys in uh, in another week. Yep. Okay, adios.